Uh, so I'm joined today with Sarah. Sarah is a part of the sorcery family as kind of an advisor and helps us out with our specification community. You know, our target, although we're building a community for agents and manufacturers and specifiers, largely sorcery is a specifier tool to help make this the process of managing the products you specify easier at the at the at the at its core you know we want to find ways that we can work better together in the supply chain and sorcery is almost like uh, a sector defining product which is around your product discovery and coordination Pro uh, product design specifically around that which is kind of um no one's done that so we're excited so sarah helps us with that uh a lighting designer by trade with how I don't know how many years experience maybe you can with, introduce yourself yeah sure I'm happy to do that um, my name's Sarah hi everybody out there I was with Canon Design I started up their lighting studio and ran that for 16 years before I scooted over to work with Sam Corbel at Light Eye and helped them prop that up and um, worked on the podcast for a while and then um, have recently started my own consulting firm and um, working with the sorcery as one of my clients because it was the tool I wish I had when I was running my team and I think it really solves a lot of problems in terms of the communication and coordination. So I think it's a really powerful arrow in the quiver. Um, and that's why I've teamed up. So that's that's my five second intro. Cool. Well, thanks, Sarah. <clears throat> OK, well, we'll start. I mean, I think if you've been in other webinars, if you know me, I have you know, similar. I have, similarly, I have about 20 years uh, experience in lighting design um, and, and a large portion of that was running a lighting design firm. So, you know, I, I understand the complexities of the product landscape. And while I was doing that, um, I was getting so fed up with it that I thought we got to, as an industry, pull together and find a solution. And that's kind of how Sorcery was born. Um, so I think one, one of the, if we start with a problem statement, I think um, the problem we have with our, with just the, the globe in general, right? With CO2 emissions and our environment and trying to become a more sustainable population, a more sustainable, like global citizens, so to speak. Um, Part of that solution is managing the process around the products you use. Um, it's it's this was actually a slide that I grabbed from. I was at Collision, which is a huge tech conference last week that we were exhibiting at, and one of the slides was you know a lot there's a lot of products around uh, that were being pitched there, not just tech products but also products around uh, you know green tech where, where they're kind of redefining how things are manufacturing. This individual was talking about uh, sustainable concrete that actually consumes CO2. And it's really exciting. And, and the point that they were making really was that, you know, the recycling, energy efficiency, green energy, et cetera, is really only part of the solution. But it's the manufacturing accounts for 31 percent of all CO2 emissions. So that's kind of the last piece of the puzzle. And that's a really tough one because, you know, you have to kind of con you, you can't just control the products that you spent, you know, as a manufacturer that you choose to manufacture your products with. You also have to create a demand and then create new habits for the consumers to have the de de demand for those sustainable products. Um, so so it's, it's like one of those chicken before the egg things. That's usually the toughest problems to solve. So that's kind of what I found the world is talking about right now. And, and I think one of the things, you know, I would say I left uh, the design field three years, um, well, two years ago, really, but probably more like officially a year and a half ago, who knows? But it was long enough ago that this wasn't as hot a topic while I was running Malvi and Banani. And I think um, it's now becoming really important. And I think one of the things I, I like to do, you know, when you're dealing with change management is what is sustainability? Have, ask a question of your design firm or even your manufacturing or your agency. How, what does sustainability mean to your organization? And to talk about it, start defining things like how important will it be to your product specification or manufacturing goals? How will you communicate this with your clients? That's key because there might be increases in costs. There might be loss of features on products, right? But there's usually whenever you're changing uh, a process significantly, especially when you're pioneering some processes, usually there's some loss of features um, and, and, and some increase in costs. So you have to how do you communicate that? And as specifiers, how would you communicate to clients that you're potentially paying a little more for light fixtures? Um, and will you make that choice to become an expert? I think that's also important. Will you communicate yourself as an expert in sustainability? And, and then, you know, as the final step, will you choose to only specify things, I should say products that meet certain standards? Um, I think those are some of the questions that, that you should start asking yourselves as an organization to start. And then I like this is, 
it was something I always like to do when you're, you're managing change is some sort of a checklist, like developing a checklist or a cheat sheet. Here's a laundry cheat sheet <laughs> that I put together, just just or that I found just, just as like a fun a fun example of how you can you can put a lot of information on a page. And I like the idea of creating like a checklist or a cheat sheet for your organization, especially if um, you're, you're as a specifier trying to communicate your goals in as uh, your organization goals as, uh, around sustainability to a large amount of people in a simple way. Um, so we're going to give you some information today and then you'll have that information with you when you leave to help maybe create that that checklist. And the next thing, you know, the next slide really talking about the tools you have whenever an industry goes through a lot of change, whether it's technology or or application. I think in this case, this revolution is really a lot about the technology around the manufacturing and the product as much as it is more so than it is about the application. Uh, so what's interesting about that, you'll see agent agents is, is up here three times. I think you got to use those resources. You really got to push your agents and manufacturers to become experts at this and communicate with you. Maybe not, you don't have to necessarily push them to get <clears throat> certified, but I think it's about pushing them to talk to you about it and become experts. And I think with the growing amount of information available on sustainability, uh, on sustainability and, and all the different certifications and, and different I guess, ways you can frame it. The content curator, which is really your agent group, plays a pivotal role in helping decision makers find what they need. Uh, and then if you make a chest checklist, that's something you can you can distribute to agents, manufacturers for options to so start building a database of products that, that you can find uh, easily discover as, as, a, as a company and keep it up to date because it's going to change just like when LED hit our market, it's going to change and change and change. I think we're, we're, we're on the precipice of a similar, um, a similar, uh, let's say blow to the specification community with the amount of education that you're, that you're going to have to have around uh, sustainability. And now I'm going to pass it to Sarah to cover awesome. a couple, uh, to cover some content around what sustainability is. Perfect. Thanks, Paul. Um, as Paul kind of said, sustainability is a big buzzword. It's buzzword in my opinion, because it's actually really important. Um, and people are starting to understand how important we're starting to see some of the consequences of climate change and other things. And the lighting industry is sort of following on the heels of what's happening um, in the architecture world. And it's a really complex beast. Sustainability means a lot of different things to different people. And we need tools just like you know, to, to make any job easier, we need a tool to, to help us get there faster. And so um, what we're kind of looking at in general is really what is sustainability? It, it could be a lot of things. And like Paul mentioned, um, it could mean different things to different people, agents, designers, manufacturers, for sure. But also, you know, what really does sustainability mean in a, in a deeper sense? Does it mean low energy use and high efficiency and long life? That's definitely a component of sustainable fixtures designed with replace, well, replaceable parts, you know, because some things do eventually fail. So something that can be replaced and looking at things like the Zaga Consortium and other things, um, designing for disassembly and with healthy and safe materials that are also recyclable and reusable. And even we're seeing compostable fixtures at the end of their life, which is amazing and materials that are sourced to eliminate health risks, reduce carbon emissions, we're hearing a lot about that. Of course, transportation, shipping, manufacturing, Paul mentioned 31%, that's a huge chunk um, of what we're trying to tackle here. And then materials sourced from and assembled with sustainable su supply chains and equitable workforce policies. It's a whole different level. And so um, if we go to the next slide, we can kind of talk about the fact that the AIA has sort of already bucketed these things for us, right? And so they, they call these buckets of different sort of impacts. So human health, climate health, ecosystem health, social health and equity, and circular economy. So these are the different buckets that the American uh, Institute of Architects has put together to kind of start to categorize these different areas of sustainability. And so, Paul, if you go to the next, just really quickly, the human health bucket focuses specifically on products which support and foster um, uh, life throughout their cycles. So it could be human health as well, but I think this also goes a little bit into the ecosystem category, which we're gonna talk in a second, but we're talking about the hazardness to humans. So this is where we're talking about, you know, hearing about PVC in, in wiring, right? We're talking about um, the way that aluminum is smelted and how that has an effect on humans. So human health is certainly one. The next bucket um, is all about climate health. 
uh, and that's about specifically embodied carbon, and that's the way that that's measured in that bucket. All right, the next bucket um, is ecosystem health, and so that's about sort of the local <laughs> ecosystem and preferring products that sustain and generate natural air, water, biological cycles, thoughtful supply chain management, restorative company practices sort of in that localized way. Right. The next one is about social health and equity, preferring products from manufacturers who secure human rights in their operations and in their supply chains, right, and provide positive impacts for their workers and communities. So again, going past the product and into who makes the product and how that product is made, uh, because that certainly has an impact on that pr product sustainability. And then circular economy talks kind of pulling this a lot of this together, designed for long life with end of life solutions in mind, closed loop manufacturing cycle, that, that sort of circular economy economy of the manufacturing that we're hearing more about in lighting as well, right? And so the AIA took those buckets and then they wrote a pledge um, amongst their colleagues, right? So people signed on to this pledge as architects saying, we believe in, in, you know, looking at this critically, thinking about the way that we design our buildings and signing onto the pledge, basically, basically signaling to the manufacturing community, these are things that really matter to us. We wanna see products that fit into these buckets and really are moving things forward. This idea of not doing less bad, but doing more good, right? And so the lighting community has taken the signal from the architecture community and basically kind of try to copy paste. So you may have heard about the lighting advocacy letter that uh, several different firms teamed together. We wrote the letter, uh, basically says similar things that the AIA pledge says. We, we reference the same types of buckets. So everybody's talking apples to apples. And as we're working with our clients in the architecture world and the interior design world, we sort of understand how these implications happen. From the bottom, you can see that there's several firms signed on. That's a cutoff because we couldn't show you the whole thing. We've got almost 100 firms that have signed on. So I think the signal is definitely becoming stronger. Sometimes we hear in the lighting uh, specifier world, we hear that like sustainability is an East Coast issue. And we're starting to see that that's uh, yeah, laughable as Paul's doing. It's obviously not. And I think coming up with um, ways to talk about things um, in, in sequence and with it as a, you know, as a group is really important. So if you don't know about the letter and you know people that ought to sign it that aren't there, please, please go ahead and share because we've got that. And that's hosted up on the Mindful Material site. And also there are a, a few other sessions kind of like this. I'm going to go through some information that it's presented in more depth on that website and they're recorded there. So if this is interesting to you or if you've got clients that might benefit from this that are asking questions about this, this is a really wonderful website web series. Um, the first series just kind of talks about the toolkit that I'm going to walk through in a second that's specifically for um, designers that want to specify more sustainably. And then uh, the next webinar goes through some case studies of how that can be uh, applied. And then we've actually got one coming up in October that's going to combine manufacturers kind of perspective as well as a museum group who took the signal from lighting and also made their own pledge and kind of talking about how the ball is being passed and how how uh, what their challenges are and how they're how they're um, how they're challenge, uh, dealing with the challenges. So yeah, so thanks, Paul. So inside the toolkit, I'm just going to kind of page through these and give you an idea of what's in there, and you can go in and learn more depth. It's a uh, PDF that's being updated as our resources are becoming more robust. And one of the first things that's in there are the definitions of all the different kinds of certifications and labels that you're hearing about. So cradle to cradle declare the different types of declare labels because there are different there's a difference between saying what your materials are and then certifying that they're red list free or things like that um, understanding row house understanding green screen hpds epds and a bunch of other things so that's all in there and they also there's this handy chart that um, helps you understand um, at the top there's those buckets that we talked about those five buckets of um, sustainability and then how these different labels and building standards and certifications address those. So you can kind of see that, for example, on the human health category, declare, living product challenge, cradle to cradle, row house, lighting for good, et cetera, all address those, right? Um, and lead kind of addresses those. You can kind of see it's got a half check, but you can see that um, well has a full check. So you can understand that um, well has a little bit more in that department. And so if you have a client or if you have a, like an end user client that's designing a building, or if you have a lighting designer client, if you're a rep or a manufacturer, and you know that they're interested in certain aspects of sustainability, now you can really start to drill down and um, help them solve their declare challenge or their lead challenge, et cetera. So that's a great resource to kind of check in. And as, as we have more and more certifications, we're going to keep um, adding to that. Uh, another handy tool that's in here. I like that. <clears throat> Sorry to interrupt. 
I like that matrix is kind of like a really good source for that that internal cheat sheet. Like as an organization, which one of these? I mean, they're all important to some level, but based upon what's on the on the market as far as like breadth of product offerings, you know, which ones can you almost say, okay, we are just going to use things that are living product challenge or at least declare label, uh, maybe not red list certified or et cetera, because that gets more difficult, but at least they de they're declaring, right? Yep, so exactly. I, I think that's that's some of the research that needs to happen as a, as a specifying organization, even as an agency, as you, as you look for new brands and curate your line cart, are some of these like, like pillars, you can become pillars of your principles of your of your business. And I think as an agency, you know, uh, design firm, I would do that as an agency, I would do that. And I would, you know, really market the heck out of that, too, because I think um, if you become an expert as a manufacturer, or an agent in this space, uh, it's 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 well, it's good for the planet. But of course, it's also good for business. You know what I mean? So yeah. and, that, well, and that, those two don't... have to align. Go back one work. one for a second, too, because another thing to add, another way of looking that as well is there's low hanging fruit here, too. Like, for example, if you look at Row House, Row House is not an especially difficult thing. I've spoken to a lot of manufacturers and that particular sort of level is not incredibly difficult to meet. And it does a ton of good. And so one easy thing is if lighting designers and specifiers said, you know, built into their specifications that Row House is a, is a verification, a label that needs to be there, that could really, you know, sort of um, raise the bar in a, in a big way because it's it's kind of low-hanging fruit. So in any case, there's a lot of information here in terms of classification and, and understanding what's out there. Then when we kind of look at projects, um, we've got some tools in here as well. So um, we've got some sort of action steps for different phases of projects. What can you be doing in SD to, to lay the groundwork for really successful DD, CD, et cetera? What, you, what can you be doing if you're just jumping in at a DD phase or a CD phase? Because of course there's different steps that we can be doing no matter where we're starting. Um, and we've also put in, should you be lucky enough to be kind of starting a new project with this going, you know, here's some uh, language that you can put right in your narrative um, about sustainability that references some of the things you're gonna be looking for to help that price point setting that's happening in SD, um, you know, help people understand what you're gonna be looking for as a specifier. When we move on to, uh, the phases where we're issuing a lighting schedule, you know, we've got really robust things there to also include and, and ways of specifying, you know, one to three name specs and even some notes and things there too. Um, so great things for you to sort of pick in place wherever you need them. Uh, you can go ahead now, Paul, thank you. Uh, example goals for different types of projects. So, you know, on a small project, a medium project, a large project, things you might try for, because I think we all understand that we can't just necessarily go for gold on every single project. There's there's usually some reasons why um, kind of hitting the, the stars is maybe impossible on every project, but it doesn't uh, hopefully stop us from setting a goal and trying to hit something and at least bringing up the conversation because um, you never know, you may be working with a client the first time you plant the seed, the next time you're watering the seed and maybe it'll bloom, you know, the third or the fourth time. So setting a goal is important. Um, and also there's a list of questions that you can ask your product rep in terms of um, showing again that signal that your firm cares and that you'd like to be seeing products that really kind of fit into these categories. And I think that will also help the reps understand, you know, what are the most important things to bring to you and let, let's not waste any time, you know, and, and only bring the stuff that's most interesting. So there's a list of questions here that um, you can start working into your tabletops and your, you know, trade show um, visits and start to ask your, your product rep as well as your, your manufacturer you know some of these things that will again send that signal that it's not just a not just an east coast thing that that everybody cares about sustainability and that we're moving there as a company um i love this chart on the left it's a it's sort of a thinking tree on starting with why if you know simon sinek you know this concept of you know starting with the, the important piece of why it emotionally matters why the impact matters and then sort of branching from there um, because sustainability is one of those topics that everybody can can touch there can be a touch point with everybody. It's not a political thing. Once you kind of break it down, it's really about um, longevity in lots of different ways. And that can be business longevity, that can be financial health of a business that also can, can float into these. So I'm really a believer that there's a lot of different ways that we can get at that. And so I'm not gonna have Paul zoom in, but basically the, the question tree starts with like, does your company have, or do you have a desire to? And then it breaks out a bunch of different things that might be of interest. And so you can sort of pick the one that feels like the one that your architect might care about the most, or the one about that your client might care about the most. And it gives you a resource to kind of structure that conversation and um, 
maybe point at some data as well um, that, that backs up why it might be a good decision from a design standpoint. And then there's also, should you get into VE land? Because we're in VE land all the time. I feel like we live half of our life in VE land sometimes. But when we're talking about potentially VEing products that you know could have an additional cost, for example, for whatever reason, it's coming from a special place or it's single sourced or whatever, um, there's a lot of reasons that it may be um, potentially on the chopping block. And these ideas give you um, some some ammo to try to you know protect the spec and um, and keep it there. So that's that's worth a read. And there's some there's some articles uh, at the bottom as well that um, that are linked there. There's also some things at the end we'll talk about. Um, but there's there's great resources there. Uh, and then if we move along, the resources page we're always adding to. If you went and downloaded this right this minute, the sorcery wouldn't be on there right now, but it will be in our next toolkit. So it'll be there. And um, it definitely belongs there because one of the things that's hard is when you find some of these products that are out there, the Declare Label product or the, the product with the HPD or the products with the EPDs, how do you share those with your colleagues? You know, I ran a I ran a studio that had six different offices, and one of the things about sort of maintaining our standards and when we find a better downlight that we want to make our our workhorse downlight and we want to get three new specs for, you know, where do we put that? How do I share that with my new intern that these are the ones we use and don't go back to that old project because of this? Um, if you don't know about sorcery, it has a lot of functionality to help with a lot of different things, but we're going to look just at the sort of channel of sustainability and how it can help specifically there. But before we do that, I'm going to pass it back over to Paul so he can just give a little bit of an architectural discussion of how the sorcery works, how this architecture of the sorcery works, uh, and then we'll layer in the sustainability piece of how you can use it. So back to you, Paul. That was great. I, I honestly hadn't been through that document in detail, so I was just like, I was an attendee there for about 20 minutes. So thanks. <laughs> what a great document. It's funny when I, we started talking about doing something like this, thinking, man, it's getting complicated for specifiers out there again. You know, and I, I, I drew a, a comparison to the early days of LED. You know, it was like ugh, the entire product landscape and, and I'd say the value proposition around products and the products you use is changing. Damn. You know, how are we going to manage that, right? Um, uh, you know, a, co a cool thing about that actually is when that was happening, we still had physical catalog libraries. So you could you could put catalogs in a shelf and put sticky notes in them and, and do things like that to help you understand what products you use for what. And um, remove it when it wasn't relevant and, anymore. And remove yeah. it when it wasn't relevant. Get that out of here. Yeah, burn it on the front lawn. <laughs> if, uh, if, if they did something wrong to or, or, or something like that. But it, it's kind of like... Uh, in this new world, I think there's 10 times the content for specifiers to go through realistically. It's probably more than that as far as number of manufacturers on the market, products on the market, product variations. 10 manufacturers have the same product type of problems as well, right? Which one is best? I think um, the fact that we've kind of, uh, for a good reason, migrated away from the catalog library, um, taking up, you know, floor space, talking to a designer yesterday, their catalog library and, and samples area used to take up 20% of their floor space. Um, so uh, that those days are gone. Uh, good, because it was a lot of paper that was wasted. Uh, when we moved offices uh, just before I had migrate, uh, transitioned away from Malvi Banani, I was the staggering, even though we were paperless for probably five years, paperless technically, just the amount of waste and catalogs that were still just lying around was staggering. So sorcery is really, I like this analogy. I use the tool analogy and it's funny, Sarah actually made this slide and I was like, we are on the same page because I can't get enough of these types of pictures because I think that's the best way to explain what's missing in, in, the, in the specification community right now is like a toolbox. I also get, give a comparison to like, if you were a mechanic and a, an apprentice mechanic and starting in a, in a shop, you know, during your apprenticeship, the one thing you know you have, you have the toolbox of your, of your mentor, right? You, you don't spend uh, a year just figuring out what tools you have to use and asking. Right. Uh, where do I get this tool? You know, and they're like, oh, well, I don't know. Go to Google. You know what I mean? Like, you know, it's just it's a very interesting that we don't have toolboxes. Um, so so I think what are your lighting tools? Really tools to me are, are products you trust, um, you know, the products you're tinkering and testing. Right. So products you've touched and you have samples of. I think, you know, touch it before you specify it is something that becomes really, really important in a, in a very complicated product landscape. Uh, it houses the technical information about the products. Right. How to install them, how much they cost, 
also should be there. We, I think we also, as you move into sus being sustainable and there are potential cost impacts, we have to be way more um, diligent about managing cost on products, projects. Um, so it should be there. Uh, questions and answers about the products as well, right? The discussion around the products should be in that toolbox and any other relevant information should be in that toolbox. And that's largely what, you know, we're kind of building it at Sorcery and, and the best, you know, the way we thought made a lot of sense. And I want to thank Sarah for actually putting together some of these diagrams for me. Uh, this is the first time I presented them, but she's like, as the builder, I think it's in your head, but we need to make some diagrams because sometimes when I explain it, so this is great. So I'll explain the architecture without going into the platform. <clears throat> but really we thought we thought about, okay, a designer needs a space in sorcery. <clears throat> and that space is where they work, where their projects are, where they collect their products, where they curate their products, but that that space needs to be connected to a community, right? So when you think about it, you have a designer workspace in, in, in sorcery, it is all connected by uh, one click away from other workspaces in sorcery. So your agent has a workspace in sorcery, your manufacturer has a workspace in sorcery. And what's nice about that is it, it, make, it means that information between all of these parties parties can be transferred very quickly you know see unfortunately things like websites and emails aren't very good at that because they're separate buckets so sorcery is really a community and it's kind of the first arc of its type that have this architecture where you know the product discovery phase and then also that product project management and product management communication management phase is all in one spot <clears throat> everybody's connected in the community um, it's not, you know, a software platform that we call community because it's because it's kind of a trending SaaS software as a service uh, term right now. It is literally uh, a community of workspaces. Um, so if you, if you go into that workspace for a second uh, in that workspace, you have projects, you have private libraries or collections, and then you have community libraries of uh, uh, collections. Um, which I guess technically actually exists out the, outside the workspace, but you access it through your workspace. In your workspace, you have a window into the community and that you can take things out of the community and put them in your workspace. And <clears throat> if we think a little bit about how that works, you know, again, in, in if we start out in the community area, you go into the community area, you go to your favorite manufacturer, you search for your favorite manufacturer or your favorite product, and it, and it comes up, right? You uh, just like you have a website for a manufacturer, those manufacturers also have pages on Sorcery. And and one of the things we like to do on Sorcery is also just kind of like standardize that information so that you know you're not l learning the user interface of 200 manufacturer websites, right? And of course, all manufacturers are at a, a various degree of evolution with regards to UX UI experience as well as how up to date they are. Websites are horribly hard to keep up to date, um, so they're typically not that up to date. So the idea is we wanted to make it as easy to keep up to date as, a, as like a YouTube channel. So the architecture of a page is kind of like YouTube, honestly, <clears throat> uh, understanding that that's an easy way to share content. And inside those those pages, you have product collections. You open up the product collection. It shows you all the products that are in that that collection. Of course, these are all searchable. You click on that product. It opens up an expanded view, a very technical view of that product where you can see application images, maybe some information on the dimensions as well as the website, right? The website is right there because we see this as a discovery method, but we understand that a lot of the technical information, especially product configuration builders, et cetera, are going to live on websites so we're not ignoring websites it's like the, one of the first things you see is go to the website get more information if you need but what's kind of neat about that <clears throat> let's talk about a let's talk about a sustainability workflow right now so let's go back to the community uh, we'll go to the community and we'll find a collection we have a collection actually there on declare products in the community and what's interesting about that is that's kind of a community built collection I see that this community also has an open part to it. It's open sourced. You don't have to be a manufacturer to post in the community. Specifiers can post in the community. We can post in the community. So Sorcery chose to kind of get the flywheel going by making a declare label collection. But I see specifiers getting together to make collections as well. well Why not? Maybe share? I can yep. interject right there. Jeez. I think it's important just to note that, you know, I've, I've heard as I've been talking with um, designers about this platform and people say, well, isn't it just like eLumid or LightSearch or what it was before? And I think one of the big differences is 
as a designer, if you know of a product that isn't living in the sorcery right now, you can upload it and it can be linked and it can be, you know, updated as well. Um, so it's it's not something that has to be, you can only play with the tools that are in the toolbox. You can bring new tools into the toolbox as well. So it is very bi-directional. And so, you know, Declare is a very specific collection, but let's say if we started a sustainability all-stars collection that was an open source community and I started it up and invited all my, my green friends, you know, then we can really start to pull you know, crowdsource information. You know, actually, I used that product, and this is what happened. Oh, you know what? They made that statement, but then I found out when I dug further. So we can really start to socialize information in a different way. Um, and you know, it can be as competitive or non-competitive as you want. You can open it up to just you and your clients, or you could open up to you know the other designers that you trust. So this open sourcing, this community aspect, is really exciting, especially when we think about sustainability and new products. Yeah, and you can make these collections. Uh, so as an example, you click into the collection there, the products in it. Um, you can also make these collections and and kind of privately publish them, which means that they're not showing up in the community, but all of your your green buddies, as you put it, you know, Sarah, people are really, this is important to them as design team firms, can, can make collections that are kind of unlisted. You know, they're private, but but they are all followed in all of the workspaces of each design firm. So it's it's present in all of their workspaces and they're building it together but it's not in the community so it's it's really uh it's really powerful i mean that's exactly the same as like an unlisted playlist on on youtube or an unlisted video on youtube right it's it's the architecture we're choosing is an architecture that we know works because these are the these are architectures that are used by companies and software platforms that have billions of users right um we really look at light fixtures as content digital content, which is like a song. It's the same thing, right? Um, and then, and then you know, again, you expand on those products, you can see them, uh, and then you can either add them to projects or follow them directly from that. So it's very transactional. You can't get to a website of a manufacturer and follow that product into your own little space. That's the equivalent of taking the brochure you know, out of the screen and putting it on your catalog library as you I love this. Oh, this is great. I'm going to I wish you could reach into your screen and pull out a brochure and put it on a catalog shelf that's sitting beside you at your desk that's searchable. That's what sorcery allows, which is a, well, and, and one of the amazing changer. things about following that fixture and what the digital architecture allows us to do is when that product changes, you know, this is a Zyko product, right? And it's a, you know, let's say it's a first generation and they come up with a new lens and there's a better efficacy on the whole thing. And it, they pushed out the new product and they're recycling the old one by following it the sorcery will allow you to get an alert say hey by the way this has been updated you may want to talk to your rep or you might want to think about using the updated product or see what the implication might be but we, there's a flag this thing is new and um you know that automation and starting to tap into some of the the powers of ai if i can use the buzzword but starting to use that sort of um that system thinking is is really powerful in terms of saving time and money as designers mm -hmm. Yeah, and some of the technology behind that is quite exciting that we're really pioneering at Sorcery, I would say, that kind of like you could upload a product record to some degree. And because it's tagged with the manufacturer and model, it connects it in that and that manufacturer's a, a verified manufacturer. Uh, you'll still get the updates. Um, so so it's even that crowdsource stuff that's up there is still going to be part of that kind of like update uh, flow. And because that's really been the, the downfall of all content platforms um, is that is that live update feature. It's like designers are hesitant to build databases because they know the second they build them, they're out of date. Sorcery has probably four core, core components of its architecture that helps you keep it up to date automatically. Um, so let's think about, we talked about the community for a second. Let's think about private libraries now. Private libraries are collections. Um, in there, you could have a collection of sustainable all-stars. So let's go back to the community. We found that, um, X, Xco, I'm pronouncing that wrong, <laughs> but anyways, uh, product, you move it into your collection, right? So that you have it there for the next time. Um, and then eventually you'll move it to your projects, right? And the, the idea, and that's all drag and drop. And I think that's, that's that kind of transactional, digital transactional relationship that we're we're used to. We don't know it, but we're used to it, right? We don't, we don't, we take for granted the fact that you can like discover a, a, a song on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, and instantly save it somewhere for the next time, and then instantly hit a button and it plays on your Bluetooth speaker, right? I, I think we take for granted of the technology around that, that, that flow. Right now in the lighting industry, 
we kind of find something and it'd be the equivalent of like finding a song on a hundred different websites, downloading the song to your C drive, you know, your desktop, and then uploading that song to a player and then plugging the player into your speaker outside and playing it like, like, like we used to do in the night. Well, I guess that would be early 2000s, late 90s, right? With like the iPod. So, uh, it, you know, where we didn't have Bluetooth, we had these pluggable connectors, you downloaded stuff. And I mean, we're, we're there right now. And, and I think it's fairly clear that we're going to move away from that to this more like the, the, the product is as much of an object during its digital phase as it is when it's a physical object, right? We're very object oriented people. I think um, our current workflow isn't very ob object oriented. But before I keep going down that wormhole, I'll pass it to. Because, yeah, we can talk about project functionality, okay. which and we should. Uh, <laughs> like, there's a lot there because once you get into projects, then you can coordinate, you can invite reps in and manufacturers, a whole other. That's a whole other Wizard Wednesday, but it's bringing it sort of back to sustainability now that you have an idea of how sorcery sort of works from a system standpoint. Um, if you kind of think about how specifically it can help people that are on the design front. One, obviously, you can find products faster. And I mentioned crowdsourcing, you know, different types of specific things that you're looking for that aren't as searchable through Google right now. Um, stop reinventing the wheel. You know, once you find something that really works and you want to be able to retain it and not go through that process for the next time, you have a place to kind of collect that. Um, you know, sometimes people move on and uh, or, you know, the project stops and starts. And, you know, wh where why did we make that decision? Why does this one have a different color temperature than everything else? Well, it's because of the, the finish that the material, you know, so there's a way to kind of collect that. It's not stuck in your email. Um, coordinating lighting information in one place real time securely in the cloud. So a change that happens isn't, Sorry. you know, no, that's all right. A change that happens. Um, you know about right away. You can communicate to multiple people right away. Uh, you can have a conversation again out of email or Slack and in the document where it belongs and very securely. Um, we can talk a lot about the security that sort of backs the system up, but um, it's secure. Let's put it that way. Um, tracking and analyzing things like energy, lighting power densities, fixture quantities, budgetary information, again, live. So you can you can get this information. It can populate a schedule um, and give you real time what's happening with my budget. You know, what what am I spending the most on? Where are my VE opportunities? You know, where, where can I be? Um, trimming things down. And then if you think about aggregating that data from project to project and really starting to think about the collection of your portfolio as a designer, you know, where where do I spend, you know, more uh, lighting money? You know, this is in this range of the country with educational projects or in this range and really start again to be drilling down into that budgetary concern, which is obviously such a big deal on, on lots of projects, but you can start to collect these things um, over your portfolio. So that's that's stuff for a designer, but also uh, let's say you're an agent, you know, how could you use sorcery? Um, this is an, it, at the heart, I really think of it as a communication tool. So it's a great way to communicate with your specifier. So I, I kind of love the the uh, analogy of when, you know, let's say Lumen Pulse comes out with a great new set of products and there's an e-blast and I get the e-blast and I'm like, great. Now I got to like click on the website, go there, maybe look at all the products and go down a wormhole. Or, you know, with sorcery, it could come through. It's all in the sorcery as the new collection. Oh, you know what? That's a perfect floodlight for my next project. I'm going to think about using that. I can bring it right over to my sandbox collection or whatever it is. So right from there, I can I can be dragging it. It doesn't get lost in my email, which is a bit of a wormhole. So that's one. Um, highlighting and showcasing product lines with sustainable features, right? So if you know that you've got lighting designers that really care about this, then you could, for example, say, I live in Boston and here are the manufacturers that are within about 100 miles of Boston. Because if you want to be able to say, I know my, my, uh, my supply chain and it comes from here to here because you want that lead credit, for example, now you have an ability to do that. And again, you can change that as your line cards change, you can collect, your collection can change as well. Or, or you could say, these are our products that are the most green. These are our, our all-stars within our lines, if you care about Declare, et cetera. Um, and probably the most important is integrating directly with the design team. And that's kind of touching a little bit in the future, but even with specific products, if I get a product and I've got a question for my agent, I can basically at you know, Ted Farnham at Boston Light Source and bring him into the conversation. Ted, this doesn't have this specific color temperature. Can I get it as a custom? What would the price be? All of that can happen right in the fixture and be associated with that record, um, which is incredibly powerful. And a lot of that translates over to if you're a manufacturer, obviously a lot of that same stuff can still work, but 
Getting products in front of specifiers in a really direct way is a big win. Keeping that information up to date, we talked a lot about that already on the, the power of being able to not have to drive everybody to your website and do that, but saying, you know what, we need to go up and sorcery, update that record, and that family's complete and ready to be specified again. Um, and then differentiating unique fixtures, just finding a way to kind of cut through all the noise in a very saturated lighting market and let people know this is what we're doing. This is what's special and um, getting it into some of those collections that sort of highlight those features. Those were the ones that I just literally pulled off the top of my mm -hmm. head when we were putting these slides together. I'm sure there's many other ways that, the, that these are really you know, helpful, but I could easily see those as being wonderful ways me as a specifier can get information faster. So from my standpoint, these seem like um, really useful things. And so I think if we go to the next one, we can just talk about really quickly, you know, the process for reviewing and collecting sorcery is, you know, a wonderful tool to help with that database problem um, for consuming content and saving content for where you want it after you discover it, you know, and making sure that you don't lose that embedded information. And we listed, you know, just a couple examples of collections that, you know, a manufacturer or an agent could have um, or, or a specifier could have that could easily become part of the process. And so when you're starting out, getting a concept going, you can direct younger designers, go take a look at these things. Those should be your beginner toolbox. Take a stab at it and we'll see how we go rather than saying, try anything, you know, and, and I'll, I'll give you some, uh, I'll give you some feedback. So there's, um, there's a lot of power here. So Paul, I'll let you, yeah. you take it from there. And <clears throat> it's going to finish it off. And I think what's, what's great, again, we have a lot of ways of keeping these up to date, you know, as a specifier, you know, obviously inviting your agents in, which is almost like giving, giving them access to your catalog library again, to help, you know, keep the products that are say EDP or HDP, um, as we talked about earlier, or declare label, uh, you know, keep, keeping your collection up to date, right? Um, because because they have access to edit those collections if you so desire. Uh, so I think, and it's also as as an agency, uh, I think probably if you have an agency, 40, 50 people, and you have I don't know. 10, 15 outside salespeople, they're all getting asked the same questions about what's what products you have are sustainable, et cetera, et cetera. And independently, they're all answering those questions and sending those products out to their specifiers. And you know, they're they're not uh, doing it and CCing you so that you can then use that information for you when your specifier asks. So there's a crowdsource uh, here where you and your outside salespeople, with the help of your inside salespeople, can help maintain these collections as a company. Right, uh, so there, there's a lot of ways um, that that we can you can keep these up to date for the first time, you know, like a like an actual organic database. Um, and then I guess there's other things like tracking it. You know, there are variables within the product records. Uh, we have something like 60 variables per product that you have to work with, and one of them is manufactured in. So you can fill those out so that when you're working in a certain market, you could search your internal database and search for things that are manufactured in that market or close to. Um, and then you can also think track things like manufacturers that just have responsible goals. Like I came up with this concept of, you know, if you know there's a series of manufacturers that are kind of aligning with your vision of what sustainability is as an organization, you can even make a collection of manufacturers. You can they're pretty you can be have fun with collections. I mean the product records just, you know, if you just want to use the image and the website link you can. And when you do that, now you can almost make collections of manufacturer logos that you could always reference for like, oh, what are the manufacturers that align again? Oh, I'll go to this collection. And I don't have all the products there. I just have an icon for each one of them. Uh, you know, we also have um, some some specifiers that use it uh, to track their, their typical details and things like that, because they're pretty open ended, the product records. Um, but again, that's another that's another talk. But I think one of the things that that I've learned a lot actually about in building a software company is kind of this iterative design process. This this uh, uh, C, we we call it uh, CI/CD in the SaaS space, software space. You know, continuous improvement, continuous deployment. Uh, it's a whole space, and there's even like a whole person that that exists in this in this industry that monitors that process for a software company so I, I think that's interesting because we don't really do that as design and i think that can as designers enough we don't have the tools to do it but the continuous improvement and continuous deployment and then determining where you automate in that process is what is the, is is really the difference between like a linear growth business and a scalable business so i think as things get more complex, design firms and all businesses need to think a little more like tech businesses with regards to this process of having tools around continuous uh, 
planning and in and in al and, and analyzing requirements and analyzing your design, then implementing, testing, evaluation, just like reevaluating and redeploying uh, things um, in a in a system. Um, yeah, so if you're interested on the sorcery side of things, I'm trying to balance the the webinar here, um, talking about the tool, uh, but not making it so silly because <laughs> I think we're really talking about sustainability. But if you're if you are interested, you can just uh, <clears throat> reply to that invite uh, that goes to me and, and, and book a demo or go to the website and click the book a demo button. Um, but we'll also leave you with uh, when we send this out with a really good uh, amount of resources. Um, you know, you have the QR code earlier that'll take you to that um, the mindful materials and the lighting advocacy letter, but you also have all those links here. So we will make sure everybody gets this so you guys can um, go through this. This is a really good collection. I was kind of going through these and this is, um, it feels like, I think some of those are in that lighting advocacy letter, but it's also a bit of like Sarah's resource list. You're getting some really good intellectual property here that she's been gener generous enough to share. Oh, so. Kudos to Brad Corner who gave us gave me, you know, the uh, the permission to list a bunch of his things too. This is all this is great. the very first link is to the lighting advocacy letter, which has all yeah. of the other materials and resources. These will be added soon, um, but these are all great. So take a look at them and, and please share them because I think as we've been talking about, sharing information is how we do this whole rising tide lifting all boats. Mm is sharing information, which is why I love the sorcery so much. So. Okay, well, we got like a few minutes left. Any, any, any questions? Anyone put up a hand or just type it in the chat? If not, you know, we can uh, give everyone eight minutes back. Looks like we uh, either answered all the questions or their heads are spinning. It's perfect. <laughs> okay, exactly. well, that's great. I want to leave oh, people on a Wednesday. We have one. <clears throat> and we have a few of our manufacturers on here, um, which is great. So Ed John is one of our manufacturing partners. So I really appreciate the manufacturers that are kind of signing up on a bit of blind faith sometimes, I think, uh, as any kind of early product, uh, any any early, let's say, software product, or especially marketplace product, where you have to have the customers, you have to have the right balance of like the manufacturers and specifiers. It's tough in the beginning. So so I think the people who have kind of you know, jumped on early with us, we really appreciate that. OK, great. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Have a good one. Take care. Cheers. Bye bye.